Gadget UK here again, back with another Neo Geo repair. This is uh, a Neo Geo MVS, it's uh, the MV1A. Uh, it's not got sound, this, so I'll show you in a second. It's playing games okay with a Unibars there. Um, you get a, a Z80 error, I think, if you use the official BIOS, but the Unibars, uh, you know, as default, it'll skip past that error, and you just get no sound. So straight away I'm thinking, could be the Z80, the YM2610, Originally this was going to be part of another video, uh, I've got another three MVS boards that I've f also fixed that will be other videos uh, soon I think, um, but I decided to separate them all because they're just going to be too long, it'll end up being like a four hour <laughs> video or something which uh, I'm pretty sure nobody wants to watch. So without further ado we'll connect this up and I'll show you what it's doing. Well just inspecting around the board here, there's one of those what the f moments actually, can you see that? It's like some sold on the end of that cap, strewn across there, and it's actually shown to uh, via or something below it. So I don't think that's going to have a, a bearing on the fault, but yeah, I'll remove that. And another what the f here. There's a cap removed, it's been smashed off, and there's a bit of a trace hanging there. I don't know whether something's shorting, whether it needs to go somewhere. So I need to work out what's going on there and get a cap uh, back on there as well and continue inspecting around. So holding down D there to go into the uh, Z80 diagnostics, you can see Z80 slot switch ignored SM1. SM1 otherwise looks unresponsive. Uh, now that's, uh, I think, the ROM uh, for the Z80. It says press start to continue, so let's do that. And then you'll see we get a different error. In fact, two different errors. Z80 dead, expected C3, actual 53. Z80 report error code 13, YM2610 unexpected IRQ. So that could indicate there's a problem with the YM2610. I mean, it does say at the top Z80 dead error com issue. So, I mean, it could, you know, the Z80 might be okay, it might not be. So the YM2610 could be the cause, could be the Z80. Hmm, I'm not too sure. I'm thinking. The, the clue there might be the response from the uh, Z80 actually, error code 13, which is, you know, YM2610 unexpected IRQ. So it might need a new uh, 2610. So, I mean, it's more common for the Z80 to be the issue here. Um, I did clean up the pins on the YM2610 there, can you see? They're just looking a bit uh, corroded on that side, so maybe some corrosion has got in. And uh, we have got a fault there. The other side of that chip is okay. So, uh, you know, there is definitely some uh, something gone on there. Uh, so whilst I think there's a good chance it could be this, this is much easier to swap out. I'm tempted to just give this a go first. Um, I've got a faulty Game Gear actually that's got one of the main ASICs I think has died on it, but the Z80 is probably good. So I might just remove the Z80 here, swap it over from the uh, Game Gear, see what difference that makes. Um, because the other thing is it's the SM1 issue. It starts by saying there's a problem with the SM1, and then it goes on to the Z80 saying there's you know dead comms error etc and then the response is a problem with the, y, uh, the YM2610 you know an unexpected interrupt um, it could just be that this is not booting code properly it's not running code properly so therefore it's not going to do the right things and respond with the incorrect things it might not even be getting an IRQ from here and just saying it has um, that I think is more probable so yeah we'll swap that out so we'll open up this old uh, faulty uh, game gear here just the one game bit screw there and then there's six or seven screws around the edges and stuff I think there might be some screws in here, yeah there are in the corners yeah so you can see this has had the caps removed from it previously this, this uh, you know, I've done some work on this in the past but it does have as you can see the same chip there a T84C00AM-6 I think that'll indicate it runs up to 4 megahertz, it might be 6 megahertz I'm not sure but yeah I think on here they run at 3.5 and, and on the Neo Geo it runs at 4 something like that. So we'll get some hot air onto that, remove that. Yeah, I would imagine it's not going to take very long to remove this because they're very thin PCBs compared to an MVS. Bear in mind, if you want to protect the rest of the board, you know, stick some caps and tape around those other components and things. But in this case, I just want to quickly remove this. There you go. Not too bad. Remove Mr. Z80. Let's 
got some ooze or something on the end of there. So we'll do the same thing on the uh, MVS board now. And bear in mind this is going to take longer, I'm sure. Let's just hope it's the Z8, Let's hope it's not that SM1, that chip, the ROM chip there. Because, uh, what would you replace that with? Uh, yeah, there might be something that's uh, surface mount E prom wise that would fit that profile, I don't know. I'm not even sh yeah, I was going to say, I'm not even sure where to get the ROM dump from. I think you can, I think emulators use that actually. There will be an SM1 ROM dump somewhere. So that might not be a problem. Uh, but the worst scenario is the YM2610. I mean, I could probably source a replacement, but they're just not the easiest things to remove, actually. Because these PCBs are pretty thick, but the pins, you know, sh uh, shrink dip, isn't it? They're really hard to get off. Oh, it's coming up already there, actually. I didn't mean to sort of lever it that way, it just came off on one side really super easy. It's nearly there I think. Yep. Yeah, not too bad. So I'll get a bit of flux on there to help us uh, mop up that uh, solder. It'll come off. What's it doing? It's sticking to the thing. So I've got some flux on there. We'll just uh, clean up the pads. I have let the board cool for a period of time here, you know, for a number of minutes as well, because when it's super hot, the last thing I want to be doing is uh, trying something like this, because the pads could be loose, you know, because the, the, the temperature is so high from the hot air. It's typically hotter than uh, the solder iron, that's for sure. There we go, that's not too bad, I don't think. I think we can get the other chip on there now. So I'm going to try a different technique, instead of adding more flux, because the, the, it goes under the chip anyway, I'm just going to clean the area underneath there with a few cotton buds, uh, and then just dump it on there, and see how we get on with the existing flux actually, because it ends up going under, no matter what, it leaks underneath with the pins, you know, so, uh, you know, if you think about it, I'm always wasting flux by cleaning it all up super clean and then adding more flux, it's just, there's no point in doing that, you may as well clean up afterwards. So this is the tricky bit now. I need to align this uh, very carefully because the pins of the you know the pitch is really narrow, and then use the magnifier to make sure it's perfect. And I'll just tack uh, the two corners, and then I'll show you before I uh, drag solder. Yeah, so I've uh, tacked this corner uh, and that one, and inspected super closely. So we'll just uh, we'll get a bit more flux on because there really isn't much on there actually. So I'll get some uh, solder. Yeah, there's going to be loads of this churning up. This is where the chip quick flux actually uh, would help me significantly. So I might just, uh, I'll see how I get on with this. And if I start getting tons and tons of joins, or it doesn't look like it's making a good connection, then I'll swap over the flux. You know, got a giant blob there, but the pitch is so small that it doesn't surprise me actually. Yeah, we'll use some desolder braid to remove that in a minute. Some more solder on this side. Yeah, I think I just need to move the ex just need to remove the excess now with uh, a bit of braid. Just trim that braid down a bit. So whilst I'm doing this, what are the odds of this fixing it? Hmm, I don't know. I mean, there's a chance, but uh, I just think I'm going to be unlucky, and it's going to be. 
either the SM1 or uh, the YM2610. Uh, that's not too bad on that side. Mop up this and get a bit of IPA there and just clean around that area. You can always reflow that afterwards if it's, uh, it looks uh, you know, a bit of a mess, but I don't think it's too bad. <coughs> you can see it looks crooked, it's not. The label on there is crooked. So whilst that gave us a different response there actually on the uh, Z80 test, it's still got the initial problem you know, with the uh, SM1. Uh, you know, I think it's not switching access between that and the RAM. I think I think that's what's going on. Um, the Neo I O chip seems to have a bearing to that. I think, looking at the one FZ schematics. Um, now, now in the meantime, uh, this spare board has arrived. Uh, you can see what someone's done to this. It's horrendous. Uh, they've levered off. Um, well, what I would assume would have been a socket. Why would you remove a socket from a board? I don't know. Just buy a new one. That's like a pound or something. Uh, in any case, yeah, so the top side, yeah, they've done some damage. Look at this, can you see this trace here? They've removed a trace all the way to the 68000 processor. How do you do that? They obviously didn't care. It's like they must have lifted it up, saw the trace was attached, and they just pulled it. Instead of snipping it. If they'd snipped it here, they at least would have something to work with. Um, so, I mean, I could get this board up and running. You know, there's lots of damage here as well. It's awful. It really is uh, sad to see a board in that state, but in theory, I could get this up and running again. Uh, you know, I could put a, a ROM socket on here. There's going to be a lot of patch wires, several at least, <coughs> and it could be fiddly to do because there's nowhere to make a connection other than on the top side. So, mm, yeah, difficult to work on. I'm tempted to keep this actually as an actual spares board, although I think in a later video I might revisit it and try and get it working. Um, and it would work, what I was going to suggest is it would work if I took the MS, uh, this uh, chip off here, uh, the uh, SM1. So I might do that, I might remove the SM1 from here, swap it over. Um, this board would still, if I got this up and running, I could get a BIOS back on there, the diagnostics BIOS, it may well get us into the diagnostics to see what's wrong with it. Maybe it's got a RAM fault or something somewhere, uh, and obviously it would be missing the SM1, but we could always deal with that later. So I don't think there's anything lost by borrowing that off there uh, to swap over onto this board. Just to rule that out, you know, we could still have a problem there. Before I do that, I might just uh, probe around with Logic Probe actually to have a look at the chip selects and things and the output enables on this and on here. Um, and maybe probe the IRQ pin on the YM2610 there just to see what's going on with those few things. Yeah, I had a probe around and I've, I don't, I see activity. Uh, I'm looking at what I think was the chip select and the output enable. Um, and I do see some activity there, like pulsing. Which suggests to me that whatever's driving those is okay. It could just be the SM1. The other interesting thing I'll point out is that I just tested it without the cart in there and still did the same. You know, I went to the Z8 to test, you know, with no M1 test ROM and you get exactly the same error. So it is like uh, a, a chip select type thing where the Z80 cannot access uh, the ROM at all. It can't even access the ROM on the cart. Um, now, the big problem is I can't find any schematics for this revision, you know. There may be some out there, I'm, I've not seen them. Um, and they're different, you know, because it's got a different set of chips on here. So that's where it becomes a bit problematic, trying to work out, you know, what to check. Because ideally, I'd like to go uh, and check, you know, properly the output enables and chip selects. The, the best I can do is uh, compare the pin out there, the SM1, to other uh, board revisions, which is what I've done. And I'm guessing, because it's the same size chip, the pin number is going to be the same, it's just in an SMD package. Um, but yeah, you can see the dilemma there, and why it's uh, super hard to work out which way to go with this. Yeah, one side's come up totally, and the other one is just lingering a little bit. There we go.
and I hope at some point this isn't a spares board. I hope that we can at least get it booted. It might miss, you know, obviously it's going to be missing the SM1, but if we can get this booting up, we can perhaps work out what's wrong with this board as well. Coming off super easy, these. Although I don't like the way they're coming off sort of an uneven fashion like that. Yeah, that's off. So there we go, that's the SM1 swapped out. Uh, I need to clean off the flux and stuff properly. Uh, we do run the risk, obviously, that this could be the fault on that other board. It could be a common fault, you never know. Uh, so it might not prove anything. It'd be nice if it worked, but I suspect it's not going to... I, I suspect it's going to be something to do with the origins of the uh, chip select and output enable. So, crazy progress, as you can see. Expected 3C, actual 4D. Let's just run that again. Yeah, expected 3C, actual 4D. I think what's happened here, the faulty ROM is the issue. It's the SM1. And I think when I swap the Z80 over, that Z80 off that game gear was faulty. That's why I think. Because I don't know whether you noticed, I can't remember whether I captured or hopefully I did. But the uh, values we were getting back changed when I swapped the Z80 over, which made me wonder at that point actually whether the Z80 was good or whether it was bad, you know, are we seeing a difference there in the value coming back because I fixed it, or are we seeing a difference there because I've put a faulty one on. So this is always the, run, the risk you run when you're swapping chips between boards, but I think we're on a positive track here, and I think actually I just need to swap back to the other Z80. Now, handily, I've still got that Z80 floating around over there, so I can just remove it, put the new one on, and hopefully we'll have fixed this one. So yeah, super annoying. That's one reason why, um, actually, I would like to try and get spares boards up to a point where I can at least boot them. So I, I've got an understanding of what is actually faulty on a board. Because uh, if you can't boot a system uh, to do various diagnostics and stuff, um, and it's not socketed at surface mode like this, you know, this is the risk you run. Now these CPUs, you can't, I can't seem to find a supplier anywhere for them. You can't even buy an equivalent or anything anymore. If you know where to buy them new, please post a link. Uh, you know, post in the comments down below. Um, there was somebody selling them on eBay. I think it was from Italy or Portugal. Five pounds each with ten pounds carriage, so fifteen quid. Uh, now I suspect they're probably reclaimed. Um, they might not be. They might be new stock. Um, but yeah, anyway, they're hard to get hold of. Game Gears are one of the few places I know you can get these from. I mean, it's a bit sacrilege to destroy game gears, but that's why I've uh, specifically targeted the uh, game gear here that I've got, where I know something else is actually wrong with one of the main ASICs. Um, and in fact, I mean, that might uh, have just turned things on its head, actually, because now we've discovered the Z80 is faulty, I think it is. That might be what was wrong with that uh, game gear, actually. I may find after I've swapped the Z80 out, it uh, works okay. There we go. So we'll do the test without Z80, that's fine. And then if I reach over, hold the D button down, select and start. Z80, oh yes, fixed. So yeah, um, you've got to follow the clues there. You know, I saw a change in behavior when I swapped the Z80. So straight away you know that there's a difference there. Not necessarily you've put a good work in Z80, but you've got a difference between the Z80 that was on there and the one you've just put on. Um, and then when we've fixed the SM1, we got past the SM1 issue. There was no uh, complaint there about the IRQ again on the YM2610. All we had was a difference on the Z80, which, you know, let's say logic dictates, actually, maybe we put a faulty Z80 on there. Maybe that's what we've done. And that's exactly what's happened. We swapped back to the original Z80 and it's fixed. So all this needed was an SM1. So as you can see, I've swapped over to the Unibar, so I'll give you a close-up on this area in a minute, but if we switch it on, and point at the screen, so we've got the cross hatch, uh, now let me switch it off, put cross swords two in, hopefully you can hear this, we do have sound, sweet, so yeah, another one uh, saved from the grave. I'll also ground uh, this crystal here as well, but uh, yeah, I'm quite pleased with the uh, progress actually. So that's that one, absolutely perfect. 
And with regards to this board that like I said had just arrived, um, that I've borrowed the SM1 for, we'll have a go at fixing this. Uh, I don't see why it shouldn't be repairable. It's just going to be a number of wires, on the, a few on the top side I think, and uh, a few on the bottom side. Uh, but we are lacking an SM1, but at least we know that. We, you know, we'll know we're going to get a Z80 issue when we come to test the sound. But the system will boot without that, I'm pretty sure. And there we are, all cleaned up. I'll let you have a close look around there. It's uh, super tidy on both sides now. You can see I cleaned up all of the underside as well. Uh, no bent pins, no uh, missing caps or anything like that. It's uh, pristine. So it's very similar uh, in many ways to the uh, 1FZ. I wouldn't be surprised if the harness here, you know the plastic part here, is the same. It looks the same to me actually. It might be subtly different to accommodate, uh, I don't know, the back plane at the back, but it looks the same. The board is about the same size and the same sort of, you know, it's the same profile and everything. And most of the chips are in the same places. Well, I say most, you know, the CPU and the ROM down here, the RAM, uh, the sound itself here. But then you've got a difference here. Um, you're lacking the C1, you've got a, a D0 down here and then there's been a lot of consolidation um, of uh, smaller ASICs into these larger ones here and then the two PALs as well. There's something like five of these, uh, I think there are one, two, three, yeah five of those Neo Buff chips so these kind of make a, a good source of spares for some of the other boards that uh, use the Neo Buff chips uh, if you get one of these faulty you know like a force, some of the force slots I think have got these, the, the later force slots but also the Neo CD and that's the other interesting thing with these, these have got a lot in common with the, the Neo CD because I think the Neo CD uses some of these chips, uh, I mean th there's a difference there, there's got a dash T uh, I'm not sure about that but if you look up the Neo MGA dash T you'll see that that's uh, used on the um, CD systems perhaps not the CDZ but the earlier ones uh, I think, uh, I remember when I, I looked at Scott's uh, you know, console snob, uh, Scott's Gaming Asylum when I looked at his Neo Geo CD I'm pretty sure I saw an MGA uh, on there uh, and it's the same with the GRC here I think you see those on some of the other boards and things as well including the CD uh, whether it's exactly the same I'm not sure but I suspect it probably is because SNK had a habit of uh, you know sharing and reusing the chips between the different uh, systems there to obviously cut costs and things the last thing you want to do is uh, have a custom graphics chip for say the CD that's difference to this why would you do that it makes no sense so I would suggest that these boards were manufactured around the time that the Neo CD uh, hit the market so I'm not sure if that's before or after the one I've said I would suspect after actually so yeah there's our faulty uh, SM1 I'll just put a cross through that just to remind me um, incidentally there's no available EEPROM or EEPROM that's interchangeable with this so you'd have to make up a little adapter or something like that uh, for a different type of chip um, it does cause you the dilemma of what to replace it with if you've not got one to stick, you know, steal from a board like we've done in this video. Now in the next video, you'll see that I get, I do get the other board up and running actually, the one I showed earlier. Um, but I'm lacking an SM1. Now the interesting thing will be to determine whether we actually need that because, from what I understand, the SM1 provides nothing other than some diagnostic uh, support to the uh, the, the main BIOS. So what I mean by that is when the main BIOS boots, it utilizes, it switches this ROM into the Z80 address space there to run some tests and things and initialization so that the uh, main BIOS can determine the state of the sound uh, subsystem, if you like. So I would suspect, actually, if you didn't have this and you used a UniBIOS with the hardware tests disabled, it may work, but we'll find out that in the next video. Um, and the other interesting thing is you could almost argue that this has been a Game Gear <laughs> repair video really because that fault with that Game Gear, I'm pretty sure it was just the Z80. I'd suspected it was one of the ASICs, you know, it was one of the ones where I'd recapped it, um, cleaned it all up, taken some measurements and stuff, couldn't get anything other than just a black screen, it was doing nothing. Um, and I suspect it was the Z80 and we discovered that by putting that on here actually and then getting a different error back so yeah uh, consider that uh, game gear probably fixed actually if I could find a source of these uh, Z80s so I've got it connected up to a uh, temporary test speaker here it's gonna sound awful but uh, let's just see if we're getting sound I'm pretty sure we are Yeah, 
it sounds terrible on the speaker. Test it with a bit of metal slug. Mission one, start. What the f is going on? So whilst it was working, it only worked for a period of time. Um, I came to test it uh, the following day, and it worked okay for about 20 minutes, and then I got some weird sounds, and I thought, actually, it's missing. It was actually messing the samples up. It was playing the wrong samples at the wrong time. So I thought, is it loose connection? I reconnected everything, still doing the same. Cleaned up the car, still doing the same. Tried a different car. That was sounded odd as well. So I put the diagnostics back in, and it was going on about the Z80 again. Uh, exactly the same error it showed previously before we'd swapped the SM, uh, the SM1 or whatever it is over here, the ROM. So I'm starting to think the Z80 is probably okay. The mask ROM is probably okay. And I think what's happening is that the YM2610 here is killing it. Because when you switch this on, I've not mentioned it, but when you switch it on, everything around here is stone cold, even after 20 or 30 seconds. But here, there's a bit of heat, not so hard you can't, not so hot you can't touch it, but it does get quite hot actually, just on one side, which is a bit odd. So I think there's something wrong with that. But in the meantime, I thought, well, let's just swap because I've got another one of these boards, I've got an AX version. I thought, let's just swap the uh, RAM over here, just rule it out. It's not made a difference at all. I'll show you. There's no damage. I've not damaged any uh, traces or anything doing that. So I've just started now desoldering. Uh, I'll show you here in a minute, just an example using the desoldering station. Most the solders come out of there as you can see there's just one or two pins one in the centre and the third one from up here that's going to need some additional work and I'm just going to take my time and be super, super careful I've ordered some of these as a replacement they do say dip I hope that uh, shrink dip because uh, these are shrink dip and there's some spare sockets I've got a socket I can stick on this in a minute but uh, yeah I thought I'll order some of these chips and some sockets so that's about as close as we can get I uh, try not to uh, mess this up it's a case of on. Yeah, getting on the pin and just rock forwards and backwards. That's going to be a ground or a uh, supply rail. You see that one's wobbling? Just wobble like that a little bit. Not too much. You don't want to put pressure because you'll lift the pad, you'll, you know, move the pad. But uh, the wobble back and forwards just frees it up and helps the solder flow really well from both sides. But that's all I need to do here is just work my way. Uh, across those uh, remaining pins down here and wherever there's one like that top one there and the two I mentioned on the other side what I'll probably do is get some flux on the opposite side of the board use some desolder bait on the other side and then have a go on blocking again from this side and you'll tend to find that that should free it up and then it's going to be a case of just going along and I've described it in many of the videos just going along doing the flick test like that that's free many of these are free here in fact they're all free apart from oh, that one there stuck uh, yeah and just make sure they spend sufficient time making sure these are as free as they possibly can be. Um, that one's stuck. That one's free. Um, because the traces on these come off super, super easy. Because they're so fine, it takes no effort. You get a screwdriver and try and you know lever it off a little bit on each side, you'll rip up a load of traces at the same time. There's quite a few traces on here. It's something like 64 pin. Yeah, it is. 64 pins. Um, and they're very, very, very close, very small pads. So, yeah, I'm not uh, looking forward to trying to get that off in a minute, but uh, anyway, I'll show you. So, from that distance, you might just be able to see, I think, some of the pins here, you know, that are not freeing up. That one, that one. The ones that join this massive uh, plane here, uh, and down here, edge one again. So, that was, this is where I'm just going to get a bit of uh, flux on this side here and use the desolder blade from this side, try and absorb as much as that as possible and then try and unblock from the other side. So I'm just using a bit of hot air to free this up, a bit of captain tape around on the various components and things there just to protect them. Uh, more on the underside than the top side actually, you know just where there's SMD caps and resistors. Uh, I did exactly the same thing here on uh, the ACA 1220 when I did that. You know free up uh, all of the solder you can using the soldering station or a solder pump but then free up with a bit of hot air because the size of the uh, VCC and ground rails there, you know, the traces, the pads and things that connect to them are so thick 
so uh, well not really thick so large in area that uh, the soldering iron just uh, hasn't got enough uh, power to deal with that thermal mass yeah there's some flux under there that's burning off So there we go, cleaned with cotton buds around there, super tidy. Um, what I would say is you're still going to have the odd unblocked hole when you, when you remove the chip that way. So I just did a similar thing, I used the hot air on a, you say this hole down here was blocked, hot air, 400, 400 degrees, I've got it pretty high actually, uh, for 30 to 60 seconds, then swap over to the soldering iron and the normal desoldering pump and you can unblock them super easy. Um, that is the way I've approached it. You've got to use the kit you've got to the best of you know your ability kind of thing really. Um, the main thing is it's come off, there's no damage, uh, you know the chip is perfectly okay here as you can see. So I can get some uh, desolder braid and clean up the pins and things on that and we'll get a socket on here. Um, I need to remove these bits of Captain now and it's been cooling down for uh, quite a while now so there's no worries putting, pulling that off. But just be careful you don't uh, remove any components when you do that because you may find if you're unlucky that uh, one or two of the components have freed up and stuck to the tape. Um, but yeah, it's looking alright. You need to clean on the underside here because some of the flux has run through the wires and things. Um, made it a bit mucky. But well, it's looking alright, I think. So the shrink dip socket is in place. The key now is to inspect super close just to make sure every single one of those pins is through. It looks like it's not flat on one side actually, that's a bit odd. It's like the pins are short on this side, what's going on there? Yeah, it's not in all the way is it? That's the thing, yeah, inspect. Inspect thoroughly to make sure that those pins are through all the way before you start to solve something like this and then just, you know, corner points, inspect. So the replacement uh, YM2610s has arrived, you can see here, this is one of them, I've marked it up with a red X, uh, there's a fault there on the FM side I think, uh, and I'll show you that later, the pins on that one aren't too bad actually, you can see, they're fairly straight, these have been reclaimed, absolutely, they've just been uh, tinned, the uh, connections, I mean you can see, just look how dirty that is underneath, yeah, that's been reclaimed, probably off an MVS I would think, I'm not sure, there may be other arcade PCBs or something in the uh, China that uh, uses them. That was the original one and you can see you know it was looking a bit oxidized on that side. Um, so that was my first thought and it was getting warm after a few seconds after power on but I'm getting exactly the same thing with these other ones and I'll show you in a sec. So I'll just put that one on the static uh, mat there hang on. Um, and then we've got a, a third one here. Um, again that one's okay the pins uh, look okay it's dirty underneath so again that's reclaimed again all they've done is tin up uh, and you can see some of them have got like little marks and dinks and uh, you know so yeah they're not uh, they're not new chips these I mean they're all cheap I mean look at that one there can you see it looks super close the solder on it I might move some of the solder but then again they might have soldered a pin on there I wonder if that broke off and someone's soldered that on or something it could well be a repair um, but yeah it's uh, very close there but that one works as well as far as I can tell I've not tested everything but I'm getting the same thing on all of them and then the third replacement is in there now and if I switch this on and I'll point to the screen so this is that third replacement and uh, just listen incidentally the one that's got the fault when you press select here that is extremely quiet and there's a little click so that's why I think there's a problem with the FM uh, on the uh, that one with the red cross the starter sounds normal. Sounds normal. And then, interestingly, the same problem happens at the same point. Just listen. Sounds fine. I'll keep firing. And when you get a certain distance in here, the fire noise changes to one of the incorrect samples like one, one, one. There you go. Two, four. So 
I'm thinking it could be uh, a banking problem. Very strange. You go in the water, it's a star. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, very odd. Anyway, hopefully you found that interesting. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you soon.